Welcome to the Tech Perspective podcast presented by Flatiron School. It's a show featuring uh, guests who are fantastic in the tech industry space. Uh, and my next guest right now is uh, an amazing guest speaker, um, uh, a principal founder of ASR Analytics, uh, Mike Savrianos. Uh, welcome to the pod. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Looking forward to chatting with you and telling folks about our experience with Flatiron. Nice, nice. Um, so I kind of wanted to start at the beginning, uh, really with you. Um, I know you've been uh, with uh, ASR Analytics for, I mean, over 17 years, but um, could you give just a little bit of background on what you were doing prior to founding uh, ASR Analytics? Sure. Yeah. Interesting question. So my background is in math and statistics. And when I came out of undergrad, uh, I was going to school out in St. Louis at Washington University. When I finished undergrad with a degree in statistics, I decided I wanted to kind of get involved in public policy issues, wanted to kind of apply analytics to policy questions. So I went to a graduate public policy program at Georgetown University. And then, you know, kind of being in D.C., it was natural to move into either kind of federal government work directly or federal government consulting. I spent a few years at a company called Mathematica Policy Research that is sort of a think tank policy research firm that does a lot of work around social welfare. Um, spent a few years there and then went on to PricewaterhouseCoopers and eventually they were acquired, or that division was acquired by IBM. So then I was kind of focusing more on consulting rather than just kind of pure policy research. And after about five, six years there, um, a colleague of mine and I decided, hey, you know, we could probably try to do this on our own. Um, decided to start a small company, started ASR Analytics back in 2004. And, you know, from the get-go, our focus was kind of at the intersection of those two areas that I'd worked in before. Uh, analytics applied to public policy and consulting. And, you know, over the years, we've grown from a, a very small company of three guys that decided to, to start their own firm to a company of, uh, pushing 150 or so people with a sustained focus on analytics, data science, and more recently, kind of getting into application development capabilities um, and that's that's kind of a little bit of my background and how we ended up starting the company. Nice, nice. Um, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that you were doing consulting work prior and then now um, decided to kind of venture out on your own with ASR Analytics. Um, one of the the guests we had previously, um, wonderful speaker, um, head of data science over at uh, Saturn Cloud, uh, Jacqueline Nolis. When we spoke to her, she she had previously did, um, she was working at a consulting firm and then she decided to go independent as a consultant mm -hmm. and spoke about like a lot of the challenges really in the beginning of acquiring customers, keeping customers. Um, was that a similar experience with, with you? Were there like, did you kind of like divide and conquer amongst the three founders? Like how did that, what was that experience like as a, as a new founder of a consulting firm? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. It was, I think in hindsight, it should have been more frightening than it was. <laughs> we probably didn't know to, enough to be, you know, uh, hesitant or scared about what we were doing. In coming from a big consulting firm like PricewaterhouseCoopers, we had this mindset, and I guess we'd sort of been taught that the way you develop business is, in the federal government anyway, is you respond to requests for proposals, you submit proposals to them, the government evaluates it, and occasionally, you know, hopefully more often than not, you win the, the uh, contracts that you bid on. But, you know, that's all a lot easier when you're working at a big company that is an everyday name, right? I mean, like they say, nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM, but, you know, probably people are a little cautious about hiring a firm that has only been around for a couple months. But nevertheless, like we said, that's what we know how to do. We know how to, like, you know, respond to these requests for proposals. So we went about doing that. We got on a couple of government uh, contracts like GSA schedule contracts, 
and that we started responding to RFPs. And, you know, much to my surprise, we won one or two of them in our first year, uh, which really kind of helped to keep the lights on as we figured out how to run a business. And it, it was, it was a, you know, a dicey time, I guess, but, you know, through a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, we got some government contracts. And from there, it was sort of, you know, how do you continue to grow from that foundation? That makes sense. That makes sense. Kind of putting one foot in front of the other, kind of <laughs> laying the foundation down and then try to build upon that, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, the, I mean, doing ASR analytics, uh, founding that company 17 years ago, you guys have seen a lot of the, the ups and downs in terms of the trends uh, in the data space. Uh, one of the more interesting trends that I've seen and, you know, maybe you can even just being closer to the space, provide a little bit more color and context is uh, the is data privacy, right? Like it's it's maybe hit like, I, I think maybe da- data privacy has always been a thing, but maybe it's been in more of like the public conversation, maybe over the last five to seven years when you see situations like what happened with um, Target and these big retailers being hacked. Um, how have you seen like your business with uh, in terms of data ethics and security and things of that nature kind of evolve over the course of that 17 years? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, especially like when you think about the responsibilities for data privacy and data ethics of a very small firm and then of a firm that is sort of, you know, delivering larger projects and even building its own solutions and managing data of constituents, customers, you know, citizens. Um, Looking back at the early stages where you're operating more as like a a service provider or even an independent contractor, you know, a lot of the hard work around data privacy is handled on the client side, on the government side. So like if we're delivering a project for a government client, a lot of the core work around data privacy is handled by by the client over you know the past decade or so as we started to build our own technology solutions including solutions that provide integrated tax system services so you know the the actual systems that are processing tax returns at the state level there's a much different set of responsibilities that you have to think about in terms of data privacy and data security and although this is outside of my uh, practice area personally, I know all the folks in our state and local practice, they spend a lot of time and effort and energy in designing approaches and designing technology solutions that put a heavy emphasis on data security. So it's, it's gone from being something that is like, you know, yes, you need to protect the client's data and you need to work on secure laptops and things like that, but it's but it's sort of largely out of your hands to being something that's kind of a core part of the everyday work. Yeah, it's what's, I guess, a byproduct of that is um, uh, like this inherent skepticism as you like work with different organizations and entities that, um, you know, promise to help you with your data. You're kind of seeing that um, even as a, even as like a, a one-off consultant, even uh, even with the bigger firms, like no one is sort of infallible to like um, nefarious actors. So it's a it's an interesting time to be in this space, and it's something that um, I actually found that a lot of our boot camp grads are actually interested in, like the the ethical use of data. Like how do you um, how do you how do you travel in this space um, using people some sometimes incredibly sensitive information. Um, to handle some of these like really interesting business problems and obviously in the pursuit of making money, um, but do it in a way that seems uh, ethical and fair to the consumers at large. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really difficult question. It's, it's interesting that, you know, folks that are working in this community around data science and, and, you know, application development are at the same time, they are, kind of in a position to protect data and and even in a position to develop solutions that help to protect data, 
And at the same time, they're also, you know, bad actors who are using those sorts of capabilities to exploit you know, data uh, security weaknesses or, you know, things like uh, perpetrate ransomware attacks uh, or, you know, uh, what do they call them? Deep fake type videos that, you know, in, in, I think are in, partly enabled by the types of data science capabilities that, that you know, what we're talking about here. It's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy. That is right. Like you're at, it's yeah, it's crazy. Like the, the technology advances for the good and the bad kind of at the mm -hmm. same time, you can kind of hope that the, the good like outpaces the bad. But yeah. that's not necessarily the case because whatever whatever is publicly accessible for the good is always going to be publicly accessible for the bad as well. Yeah, yeah. You, you see it, that same pattern play out in a lot of the work that ASR does around fraud detection. But a lot of the work we do both at the federal level and at the state level is around developing machine learning algorithms to detect fraud or other types of anomalies. And it's a game of kind of, you know, cat and mouse. It's like how you know how far can you stay ahead of the bad actors to either identify them, you know, and, and kind of root them out or deter them from the attempted fraud by making it too costly or too difficult or have too high consequences for what they're doing. But meanwhile, the bad actors through a variety of methods are getting better at sort of spoofing things that look legitimate or coming up with ways to work around those detection and prevention mechanisms. Yeah, that's true. And on the topic of like data protection, our, I was doing some research into this because I was interested in this question of um, like, are companies too reliant on cloud computing, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, obviously like the, the, the data people are storing is, is growing daily especially these larger companies you can think of. I mean, I can't even, I wouldn't even be able to conceptualize the amount of data that Amazon holds on to or Target <laughs> or like Lowe's or, or Home Depot or something like that, right? Um, what's your take on that? Like are, are companies a little too reliant or cloud, on cloud computing or is, is it kind of just inevitable that with this amount of data, you, maybe some hybrid version of it is the best, best take? Yeah. I it, that's a great question. It's probably a little bit of both, you know, coming from a company that has focused a lot of our attention on government markets. You know, we tend to see things evolving from like a data storage standpoint, a, a few years behind what's happening in the private sector, you know, in part because maybe the government isn't always at the cutting edge of the technology curve, but also in part because I think Government takes very seriously its responsibility to protect data and is very conservative when it comes to taking chances in exposing their data to security breaches. And, and at least in a lot of the clients that I've worked with, that the way that plays out is they focus a bit more on on-premise data storage and they're a little more reluctant to get into cloud storage. But as you pointed out, I think it is inevitable to some extent as the volume and the velocity of data continues to increase that we're going to, you know, and in order to tap into some of the huge advances that you can get out of compute power, you know, in the cloud, I think more and more government agencies are going to start to move in that direction. We've definitely seen that happen over the past several years. And I imagine it's a trend that's going to continue and, and accelerate. Yeah. I, and that, and, all of my research has like sort of validated that, right? Like it's, you can't, you can't kind of undo this, right? It's, it's not like you're gonna, it's not like a, um, like a hard drive or something like that where it's like once it's capped out, you gotta start deleting the old stuff. It's like, you kind of need all that information to, to properly uh, uh, make your decision. Um, I wanted to play a little game of Mythbusters. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's because it's a conversation that I've had admittedly with folks that are outside of the tech space. So <laughs> just for anyone who might be watching that's potentially interested in data science, um, is myth, myth or real? Data science will eventually be taken over by artificial intelligence. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> I feel like there's no clear cut answer to this, but uh, if I want to put on my hopeful hat, I will say data science will not be fully taken over by artificial intelligence, at least not in any timetable that uh, you know any of us listening to this podcast are going to be aware of. <laughs> I think there's too many, well, there's, there's too much diversity in the domains to which data science is applied. In other words, like, although the underlying analytical methods are often very similar or even the same, and, you know, computers can be taught to uh, apply those analytics in a way, in ways that are beyond what humans could do independently. I think there's so much domain knowledge that's needed to kind of point AI capabilities in the right direction that there's going to be a long period where human understanding of business processes or other dynamics are going to still be a really important factor in progressing AI. So that's my optimistic take. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I think I join you in that take too, because that's one thing that I preach to students when they come or prospective students rather. And I, I think as this podcast goes on, people are going to hear me sort of beat that drum of like business intelligence is so key. Domain knowledge is so key. And I think when folks come in here, uh, especially folks that like maybe have a math background and don't have the coding or have the coding and don't have the math, they're kind of singularly focused on the technical skill that they need uh, to, to do the job well, which is obviously important. But the, the business intelligence side of it is so key. So I wonder if you, if you could speak to like how key that is, especially for, you know, as you're looking to recruit folks to come into your organization, like. Um, what kind of, how, how do you kind of feel people out for like how well they, uh, they can sort of help out on the domain expert side of things? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. You know, no, nobody can be an expert in every domain, right? And it, it takes a long time to acquire the knowledge and context to be an expert in a subject matter. And if you're able to acquire that, that expertise, you know, that's invaluable in thinking through data science problems because it enables you to sort of take a set of data and not just be able to manipulate it, but to understand what it actually means. And beyond that, to understand like, what are the important questions that you would wanna ask and how would you use the data, given its meaning, given its limitations, to answer those questions? So what I think is really important, uh, an important capability in a data scientist, isn't necessarily that they have domain expertise across a lot of areas, or even initially that they have domain expertise in any area, but rather that they have the ability to acquire and use domain expertise alongside their data science skills. So somebody who like is able to think like in a scientific manner, right? To be able to kind of break down questions like, a, like an experimenter would, and then be able to kind of acquire enough domain knowledge, either you know, through, through reading or through interacting with other domain experts, acquire enough knowledge so that they can say, all right, I'm going to be like an interpreter between you, the domain expert, and the data that I'm working with. You're going to help me understand the data. I'm going to help you understand how we can derive insights from it. Um, so it's, I, I think that's like the, going to be the, the kind of critical capability for data scientists over the next, you know, many years is the ability to kind of serve as that intermediary between data and analytics and kind of the ability to interact with those domain experts. It's the only thing separating us from the machines is our domain <laughs> expertise. <laughs> we need to hold on to it for dear <laughs> <laughs> We are we, we are one generation of no domain experts away from like IRA. <laughs> 
you know? Exactly. Otherwise, it's Matrix reboot all the way. Hundred <laughs> percent. We're all living in, in. We're all living in spaceships. We're in two. We, we're in tubes with the thing in the back. Like, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Uh, what another area I wanted to uh, kind of cover is uh, the boot camp grads, right? Something that's going to be a consistent theme in this podcast is the fact that uh, some I'm, I'm going to say some uh, some employers in the space uh, don't quite see the boot camp grad and the uh, traditional college grad the same. Mm-hmm. And the the founding of AS, ASR, ASR Analytics uh, predates the boot camp boom, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. What was it? What, what was that transition like for you guys uh, to to start to take on as many boot camp grads as you have? Um, was there a bit of skepticism in the beginning of it? And and what were those like internal conversations like? And what kind of you know, essentially um, moved you uh, to now where you're hiring a lot of Flatiron School grads? Yeah, yeah, interesting question. You know, and and we started to hire Flatiron grad students, it was probably three, three, four years ago. And to be honest, I had only recently at that time become familiar with the program. You know, the first person we interviewed who had been through the program explained to us how it worked. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't heard about it before. Um, and we ended up hiring her because, well, there were a bunch of reasons. I mean, she was very, uh, she had a really high analytic aptitude. She'd obviously developed a lot of, of strong technical and analytical and programming skills through the Flatiron course. And also, you know, she was super driven, right? She had like an energy and a a kind of passion and a commitment to everything that she talked about when we interviewed her. And we thought that's going to translate into somebody that's equally passionate about the work that they do. And it's interesting because like, there's a lot of, of several of those traits, I think are representative of many Flatiron graduates. You know, it's, not, not everybody, obviously, coming out of the program is the same, but I think there's something about the program that attracts people who are, one, very motivated and driven, right? It's an intensive course. They got to spend, uh, they got to work really hard to, to get through it. I've heard that, you know, it's a, a, a kind of uh, uh, an aggressive paced class and, and you right. got to be, be putting in a lot of effort to, to get it done. So the people who are in it, they obviously are very motivated and also have a really strong work ethic to go through it. I've even talked to a bunch of people who have done either self-paced or even the full-time class while they're juggling something else. So, you know, hats off to those people. They're, they're putting in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, and again, this isn't universal, but it seems to me a lot of people who come out of the Flatiron course are people who came from a different kind of background, right? They, they've already gotten some taste of work experience in a different profession, maybe. We've hired people who were mechanical engineers. We've hired, hired people who were architects. We've hired people who were uh, high school teachers and physicists. And all of them kind of, after a couple years or maybe several years in their profession, decided, I want something different. I'm really interested in data science. I want to throw myself into this field. And this is going to be something that like allows me to make that transition. So there's something I think pretty cool about that, that like you're getting people who not only have a passion and an aptitude for data science, but you're getting people who have some perspective that they've developed in a different domain, whether it's teaching or, you know, hard sciences or something like that. It's, you, you end up with a really diverse kind of broad, broadly kind of perspectived uh, set of people. And that, I think that's really valuable. I, I, you hit it right on the head too. Cause like, that's, that's what I actually think um, is so, it's like those, those soft skills, those, those intangibles that you get when um, 
you know, you mix that like that mixed bag of, of people, even when we have the boot camp here, uh, you have like people from all this, all these different backgrounds kind of exposed to each other. And they're talking to each other in a in not just a professional setting, but a social one. And mm-hmm. I think it just it helps de- helps you kind of develop as a person. And I think that's that's kind of one of the things that we really try to focus on is is how do we develop you as a prof- an, an entire professional and not just um, a, a technician, right? Because uh, you don't hire technicians, you hire professionals. You know. Right. Right. Um, so speaking of that, though when you have this like diverse group, you know, that I, I think that tends to help the, the sort of company culture. Uh, I'm curious, like as you were founding the company and you were hiring maybe like the first three, four or five people, um, was that something top of mind, like the, the company culture? And I'm curious, like if you could speak to like, what do you, what do you think the, the company culture kind of was when you started and has it changed at all? Like as, as the years have gone on? Yeah. Yeah, it, really interesting question. Um, obviously, culture, as you get to be a larger firm, becomes something, I guess I'd say, more deliberate. Like, mm-hmm. it isn't just arbitrary and a, a sort of outgrowth of the people that happen to work there. It's something that you have to kind of make, you have to be aware of and pay some attention to and, and put in some effort to try to create and, and cultivate. I would say in the early days of ASR, and this is probably true of a lot of small firms, the initial culture is just a, a reflection of the, the handful of people that work there. And, and I would say, you know, from those early days, ASR's culture was, um, was collaborative and collegial and not, not at all sort of the, the alpha, like type A personality kind of, you know, yeah. uh, what is it, the up or out, they sometimes say at, uh, at, at big consulting firms, either you progress quickly in your career or you're out the door. You know, ASR has always been, I, I won't say an academic environment, but kind of a collegial environment where everybody wants to help one another and, and in doing so, help the firm to achieve its goals and help our clients to achieve our goals. In fact, you know, we talk a lot about three primary um, kind of dimensions by which we evaluate our performance, client, people, and firm. You know, we want to make sure that we're delivering the best possible services to our clients. We want to make sure we're creating an environment that is uh, kind of uh, positive and productive for our people. And we want to make sure that the firm is growing and thriving and, and dynamic. Um, so over the years, I think those cultural traits that were at first just a reflection of the people that were there became kind of more part of the fabric of ASR. And it's something that we try to, you know, make more evident to our people and sort of build institutions within the firm that represent those uh, those cultural characteristics, you know, and and certainly over the past couple of years, I think there's been a, 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 a you know across the the world and and within ASR as well, much more of an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and 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 sort of just making sure that those things are at the forefront of our attention. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love that. Um, especially like the the learning environment, because you think of people like starting out their career, you know, when companies say like, I feel like every job description says like fast paced, like you can learn in a fast paced environment. And I always think that's 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 like a a sneaky way of saying there's there's going to be a lot going on. It's going to be really quick. And there's not a lot of grace for fail for, for any failure, right? For any mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just such a tough environment to create, especially, you know, specifically speaking about coming from a boot camp or even the tech space, like they, even data science and in cyber and software engineering, where we actually preach having a positive relationship with failure, right? And you know, an environment like this is like a, 
it, it's an environment for you, like controlled failure, mm -hmm. right? And I just, I wonder if, if companies were a little bit more on the forefront of saying, you know, obviously we don't want you to fail, um, but there is some grace for you to sort of um, learn through failure, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, you know, in, in consulting as a profession, I think, uh, especially in the government space that we work in, a lot of the work is, or is kind of or organized around projects that we're delivering. And there's lots of different roles on those project teams. Uh, you know, we've got very new junior consultants who may be coming right out of school, may be coming right out of Flatiron. And this is their first data science professional work experience. You know, they are going to be kind of expected to learn on the job to start out doing things with a higher level of, of guidance and supervision. And yes, they'll fail at some things, but in doing so, they will learn how to do those things correctly, how to do them more independently, and they will gradually kind of progress into roles where they're working more independently and eventually leading and managing the tasks that they originally were struggling to perform. And I think it, that sort of progression, you know, is something that we really strive for in the work that we do because it's, you know, as a consulting firm, your people are your, your primary asset. It's like, that's what makes or breaks the, your performance as a company. And if you can't develop, you know, those people and help them thrive in their career and help them to progress into those roles of increased responsibility and impact, then, you know, things will all break down. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned earlier as well, I wanted to get back to this because I thought it was interesting that you guys are, uh, ASR Analytics in particular is going into uh, expanding into uh, application development. What drove that decision? And um, yeah, just a little bit more about that. That'd be interesting to hear. Yeah. So we, for a long time in our work in the federal government space, have been primarily focused on service delivery. And those services are often kind of involve advanced analytics or data engineering or even certain types of programming. Um, but they didn't veer as much into actual application development for a couple of reasons. One, you know, a smaller firm is going to have a harder time convincing a client that, hey, you should let us build this application that we're going to go deploy and it's going to face your customers or your constituents. And that's even harder, I think, in the federal government because a lot of the work that they're contracting for on the application development side is going to be delivered by you know, large system integrators. They're not going to be looking to a smaller firm to build kind of these enterprise scale applications. But you know, as we progressed as a company and as we grew, we realized that delivering services, while it's useful, it doesn't have a lot of kind of um, per permanence to it. You know, it's like you deliver, you do some work, you deliver a service, and then it's done. And then, you know, you have to move on to the next thing. And we wanted to be able to take a lot of those capabilities that we were building through those services engagements, maybe business intelligence tools, or maybe predictive models or visualization capabilities, we wanted to be able to turn those into applications or technology solutions that we could say, all right, we're going to take what we built here, we're going to put some uh, customization around it and be able to offer that as a solution to a similar problem. Um, so the desire to be able to kind of pivot to a couple adjacent areas while using the same kind of analytic capabilities was one big driver. And then in our state and local government practice, you know, where I think the ability to get into the application development market with smaller clients is a bit easier, it's been an even more pronounced effect that they have kind of driven towards application development as a core part of their work. And, and again, part of that is that at the state level, 
most, it's much more common that they will look to a technology solution as an enabler rather than look to lots and lots of services engagements. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, a lot of the work we do is in tax analytics and, and tax administration. State tax agencies need software in order to process their tax returns and identify fraudulent returns. And they want all of that to be kind of built into their technology uh, overall solutions and processes. So that was the other big driver is like, in order to be a serious player in the state market and the state tax administration and analytics market, we really needed to take those services, those ideas and um, knowledge that we had and turn it into applications that could be deployed and reused. That makes, I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? It makes perfect sense to create a solution that feels um, kind of all encompassing like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, obviously you understand the, you understand exactly what the trends are in your particular space. Um, and you're kind of going in that direction with this new, um, this new initiative. Um, for da maybe data science particular, in particular, what trends are you seeing that are maybe exciting? And what trends are you seeing that are like, I don't know about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's an interesting question. There's, there's probably a number of trends that I think are, are really interesting and exciting if you're getting into data science at this point in your career. Mm -hmm. A couple that seem really interesting to me, and I'll admit to not being a, a technical expert in these areas, but the ability to apply machine learning to unstructured data, to things like images and audio files and text, I think unlocks a huge new kind of frontier of capabilities and, and potential. I mean, I'm still amazed when I, I like snap a photo of something and pop open Google Photos and it immediately like tells me all of the things that that might be, you know? It blows my mind. It's so creepy. Like I, <laughs> I, I had a folder, of, it says, what you like to eat? Because I had this, I had like a week long of just cooking like random foods and I had a whole folder. I'm like, like next thing you know, Google is going to say like what the food exactly was. I mean, it's just, it's a <laughs> lot. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and from what I understand, I, I, like I was, I think listening to some podcast recently and they were talking about image recognition capability and how a lot of the neural net based algorithms that they're currently using are still at a fairly kind of simplistic level that, that they're still improving pretty rapidly makes me think that the amazing capabilities that we're seeing now in terms of machines interpreting images mm -hmm. uh, and video and, and sound are only going to grow and they may grow by leaps and bounds. Um, you know, I don't know where all that takes us, but I think being a data scientist uh, in this environment and being able to work on those sorts of problems as you know computing capabilities continue to grow as the amount of data continues to grow and the digitalization of that data expands i think that's super exciting i i agree and and to answer the question of where it takes us it takes us to artificial intelligence and irobot that's exactly <laughs> it. it takes us right there <laughs> to, yeah. to frontier where we can't turn back. I, I'm nervous about it. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little nervous about it because it's, it's, you know what, I'll tell you the, the technology that makes me a little nervous. It's um, like going through the airport. I, I don't know where I saw this. It might have been on like a YouTube binge or something like that. But <clears throat> using like image classification, I think that's what it, I think that's what the technology they're using from the video camera and the the, the, the technology is like screening people's faces and uh, like using different data points to understand like the, like the threat level or, the, um, or how, how likely is this person to be a threat based on other images of, of people that have you know, actually executed 
um, planned attacks. And it's like, now, if we're doing that and there's no human side to actually uh, truly sort of troubleshoot whether this is or, or decide on whether this is the right um, sort of uh, thing to, to act on or anything like that, like that to me feels like we're, we're kind of approaching dangerous territory and the idea that everything that that's sort of any technology that's behind the scenes eventually comes to, to public uh, use at some point um, makes me a little nervous about the future unless we have like sort of like the, if the pendulum swings like so heavily in one direction, the, the we got to come back to the to sort of like the, the balance in the middle. So that's the type of stuff that makes me nervous personally, you know? Yeah, no, you make a really good point. I mean, I think there's been a, a lot of attention, but not enough on the fact that when you just base decisions on data and like all the patterns that exist in data, you are kind of unavoidably biasing things based on the way that the data has been observed and recorded. And you're almost certainly building in bias into processes you're, uh, you're you're probably doing a fair amount of profiling and you know without intending to do it, but you're right. It's it's some slippery slopes there that um, I, I think will need careful attention to avoid you know discrimination in the interest of process improvement. You know what I mean? Exactly, and that's and that'll be the that'll be the reasoning, right? That's the reason we're doing this. It's, it's, it's for safety, it's for this, it's for that, which of course on, on the surface is a, obviously a great reason to do these things. But um, if we don't have like real intentional uh, people and processes behind these machines, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of run rampant and it could, it could get, I think the, like, like I said, like this pendulum swinging in this direction, we hope that it kind of stops in the middle, but you know, like with everything, like this, the pendulum might swing so far in the other direction where they're right. looking to sort of take us backwards te technically. And, you know, that's right. obviously not what we're, we're trying to do. Yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting too. I think a another factor that plays into exactly what you're describing is the degree to which people are willing to give away their data, right? Because there's lots of benefits to doing it now, right? Like whether it's, going to the airport and like, you know, they're going to do a little retina scan and then you get to go through uh, TSA pre-check or you get to go through clear and you're like, get to your destination quicker, but they're capturing all these biometrics about you. Or, you know, somebody was mentioning to me, uh, cause I, I think I did that 23 and me like ancestry thing a couple of years ago. I did it without even thinking about it. I'm like, Oh, this would be cool to figure out mm -hmm. kind of, you know, who my ancestors are. And then, you know, somebody's like, you ever think about like where all that data is going and like, what are the, what are people going to do with all that data? I'm like, I didn't think about that, but I wish I had. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but, right. you know, there's a, a lot of data being collected about people and, and there will need to be a lot of thought about how to manage that kind of carefully and ethically. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm. I'm also happy that like conversations like this exist and it's, it's actually, um, it's a conversation that's had in like the court of public opinion. So at least it's out there and people can understand. And like, you see like companies like Apple that are tr like, every time I download a, an app or something like that um, and I go in, it says like, ask the, ask the app not to, to track my information and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You got solutions like, Duck, duck, go that doesn't uh, doesn't track your information as a search engine, like at least in this space, like there's a little bit of options, right? You know, as, as opposed to like um, maybe a few years ago or maybe even a decade ago, like like there was a bit of a monopoly on certain sectors. And it's like, well, you either play or you're out. And um, yeah, at least there's some power back in the people. And, you know, we're kind of staving off that. Uh, that eventual robot riot. So mm -hmm. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, Mike, uh, I appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, before we wrap, uh, I always ask this question at the end. Uh, what is a quote that you personally live by? 
Wow, a quote that I personally live by. Man, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a single <laughs> a single quote that I live by, but uh, <laughs> the only one that comes to mind right now is uh, that quote from that Ferris Bueller movie that uh, was popular when I was a, a youngster. And I think uh, he said at the end, you know, life goes by pretty fast. If you don't stop and look once in a while, you might miss it. <laughs> I try to remind myself with like all the fast paced stuff going on in the world, you know, you got to you got to take a moment every once in a while, not just get too, too caught up in the action. Absolutely. That's a great quote to live by. You know, <laughs> you blink and your life is gone. So you might as well stop and smell the roses, right? Exactly. Well, thank you, Michael uh, Stavrianos. Uh, if people wanted to, uh, to check out ASR analytics or, and, and check out to see if there are any job openings, uh, tell them where they, they can go. Yeah, you can check out our website at www.asranalytics.com. Um, you can find uh, on that website all of our open job postings. We're also out on LinkedIn, so you can catch us there. And I really appreciate the chance to talk to your audience, Jelini. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's been great, man. Thank you so much.